we're talking about tonight, off-season management, is stuff that you're really not going to put into practice until probably like next August. But it's, it's things that we, we go over and over and over because they're important. Um, and everything, your off-season management, your style of working your bees, your purpose for beekeeping, your, your pest treatment, all this kind of works, it all works together, right? And there's lots of different ways to do lots of the things that, that we're going to talk about. Um, can we stand on that? Am I too short? Okay, I can't go past this in my line. All right. Um, so, um, let's, uh, let's just get started. So, there's a lot of different opinions about how do you care for bees, how do you overwinter, what do you do in off-season. Uh, Jason does things one way. I do things a different way. Whenever I was only my first couple of years in here, I did things yet a different way. It really comes down to there's, there's options, and there's things that make sense, and then there's a lot of opinions. So, um, what, whatever you decide to do, know why you're doing it. Don't copy someone. Don't. It's not a step one, two, three, four, and you're okay process. You have to understand why you're doing what you're doing. So, um, let's just get started. <clears throat> Half a dozen hives here. Um, see the little dots out here? These are bees that have either exited on their own and couldn't get back in or died in the hive and, and our, our, um, our worker bees carried them out and dropped them. You're gonna see these hives are all wrapped. Uh, looks like they all have telescoping covers with a rock or something on top of them. Um, and the heat alone that these guys make, you can see there's a little bit of a, you did it around each space of the hive, they're, they're keeping heat. Let's talk about the obvious thing there, the wrap. To wrap or not to wrap your hives. Um, I've wrapped hives in simple tar, tar paper before, easy, easy to purchase, easy to buy, easy to staple on. Um, I did it for a couple of years. I'm not sure I saw any benefit from it. I did it because I wanted to get my, my bees every chance in the world of making it through, through winter. Um, if you decide to wrap, you also need to be aware of, you know, let's not take away ventilation, the need for ventilation. Um, over winter, you've got, you've got cold, you've got moisture that can be created in the hive, you've got food stores to worry about, you know, do you supplement the food or not, do you do other things that we'll talk about to help your bees get through the winter. Um, Jason, I'll take your opinion on wrapping. I, you're not wintering in Iowa. Your bees go, but I, I don't. I have wintered plenty of years in Iowa. I just don't in recent years now because I'm doing more of the pollination services. But I did take a year where I wrapped a hundred of my colonies and I left a hundred of them non-wrapped, and I had the exact same results yeah. for survivability. Um, really, you have to have the perfect circumstances for wrapping to either be a benefit for you or a detriment. It can go either way. So if you're just looking at it cost-wise, you're probably better off not wrapping your hives because you can flip a coin whether it's going to be those circumstances or not that winter where wrapping would actually be of a benefit. Uh, wrapping is, does two things for you. If you had any slight gaps in your boxes there, the wrapping does block the, the wind from penetrating those small gaps and stuff. But the main reason people wrap their hives is for the additional warmth that it would give the hives during sunny days. Well, that's fine and dandy if you're middle of January and it's a 20 degree day and you're hoping that by wrapping your hives, you'll allow that cluster to break and uh, move a little bit from where it was at, get onto some feed and get some better nutrition. Um, not better nutrition, but get additional nutrition there um, because of that, that perfect temperature range that you're hitting, that the wrap is warming it up versus the outside temp. However, it can also play against you if you have a mild winter, uh, that wrap is going to be raising the temperature of the hive 10, 15 degrees and the bees are going to constantly think that spring is kicking in and they're going to then start being more active, higher metabolism, trying to rear brood, and that's fine during the daytime, but nighttime kicks in 
and that wrap doesn't provide any additional heat, so you're killing off brood, and it can actually be a detriment that the bees are expending more nutrition, more of their winter resources in that mild time because of the wrap on the hive. So in a winter that is brutal, wrapping can be good. In a winter that is mild, you're just shooting yourself in the foot and you don't know what the winter is going to be like. So do you wrap or do you not? That's up to you, really. It, you're, I, I swear to God, it's 50% of the time it's going to help you out, and 50% of the time it's going to actually hinder you. So do whatever you feel is best in your apiary. Yep. And you'll see in the slides we go through, most of these winter slides, pictures are of wrapped hives. The person that created this, that was their bent, right? That they think wrapping is helpful, so you'll see it there. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, as far as protecting hives for winter, I think the most beneficial and inexpensive thing I do is I try to give my hives a windbreak, uh, especially from north of my hives and west of my hives. Whether I have them up against uh, timber or if they're out in an in a open area, I'll drive some posts in and wire up some 4 by 8 sheets of really now expensive plywood, and but, but anything just to stop that wind from just going right by them. Um, I, I, again, maybe it's superstition on my part, but to me, I feel like that makes a difference for me. Um, let's go on, Jason. Um, things you can do off season or early in the season, right about now. Um, anything that's in your way of getting to your hives, weeds, other obstructions, um, pests, mice, mice, skunks, ants, etc. They're, they're gonna, those are gonna be there, right? We're doing this outdoors. Um, Something to think about when you're doing your wind breaks and stuff. Um, a lot of people with acreages think that hay bales are great for wind breaks. Well, I told my yeah. nightmare story of my case, but even if you knew that you were the person that owned those hay bales and weren't going to knock over your own hives, mice love hay bales in the wintertime. They're going to build uh, condos, basically, in those hay bales. And when it comes to going to the grocery store to go get food, they go out of their condos, they walk five, 10 feet over to your hives and they try going in the front of your hive and going ahead and getting a, a nice chunk of honey reserves and going back to their little mouse condos to feed their families, so. If your bees are clustered, they can get by with that, right? If it's cold and your bees are all in a cluster that they're not gonna break, stores open, they can just go get it. Um, so yeah, spring, summer, and fall. Almost any time I'm out at a bee yard, especially if I have to travel there, I carry a weed eater with me, you know, to, to knock down weeds. And um, it's just whatever I can do to make life easier. I want to enjoy this beekeeping thing. I don't want to be, you know, I'm here with 10 minutes to, to do stuff and I can't because there's stuff in my way. What else do we have? Next slide, Jimmy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that. Nice, nice. Look at all those supers, man. One, he's got a third deep, four legs. Gosh, that's, that's just wishful thinking. That's bragging. That's, <laughs> that's bragging. But uh, that's kind of what mine, you know, Jason, you'll probably see it this summer out at uh, one of the places I have. It's 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 prairie, and I've got to walk through it to get to my hive sometimes. So, like I said, I do a lot of weed eating. I try to keep things where I can get to it. Um, if there's something I can do in the winter, like, you know, throw down some, some uh, matting and gravel, I'll, I'll do that. It's easier to do that before the bees are there. Um, yeah, that's a lot of honey. All right, let's go on to the next one. Fall management starts in August. So again, this is this whole season repeats itself and everything you do works together. We talked about uh, harvesting last class. Uh, you remove your supers of your surplus honey from the hives. August is great because it gives you time to um, check your mite load and determine, likely not if, but what type of mite treatment you need to apply. Um, if you have zero mites in all your hives by a very effective, good mite count measure, not, I don't see any mites, but like I've done a alcohol wash, and you have no mites, that's fantastic, great. Zero mites is about the only occasion when you have no mite treatment to do. And if you get a zero, I would check again, maybe in a few more days, just to make sure you, you've got an honest zero mites. Um, but, Likely you're gonna to have to treat in, in the fall 
for mites, um, your result of your mite treatment will tell you, do you have to have pretty regular normal treatment or do you have a hive that's really in trouble and it may need either a higher dosage or a more extended dosage of mite treatment to, to get that hive back to healthy. Um, you, all these mite treatments have a time window to do them in. Uh, and, and you need to give yourself time to do that and then get healthy bees that then go into winter for you. And we're, we're really not kidding about this mite stuff. Uh, I'd even go as far as to say when you're doing your mite checks, don't even bother with the powdered sugar method. Um, actually do an alcohol wash or an ether roll. You're, it's gonna be your first year and you're not gonna like killing the bees, but the queen is laying 1,500 a day. 1,500 a day are hitting their final birthday and dying of natural causes. Go ahead and kill 100 to 300 bees and get an accurate mite count on your colony here. Um, Andy Joseph, the state apiarist, was just telling me a story the other day of a beekeeper that called him out to his place because he wanted to find out why all his bees died this wintertime. And the beekeeper told him, no, I didn't have any mites in my hives. And Andy's like, well, how do you know? And the beekeeper's like, well, I was checking the bees. And he's like, well, how did you check the bees? And he's like, well, I was looking at them pretty good and I did a sugar roll once and I, I couldn't find any mites. Well, sugar roll is the least accurate way of checking for mites. And a lot of the mites can be hidden in the powdered sugar that you're trying to do the check with. Unless you actually have done sugar rolls numerous times and have gotten good at seeing mites covered in powdered sugar, you might just assume you have a clean hive and you didn't notice these 15 little granules there were really live mites just covered in white powdered sugar, okay? So anyhow, Andy goes ahead and takes a big sampling of the hive and he's checking it for various diseases and etc. He's then going through the loose bees there and he's finding in the, the dish all these tons of dead mites falling off of the bees. So again, he tells the beekeeper, all right, well, I know you said you had zero mites, but your hive was actually heavily infested with mites. And uh, I'm showing all the diseases that mites carry into your hive being heavily loaded into these bees' bodies and stuff here that were in the wintertime. And the beekeeper still wasn't believing him. So if anything, just please pay attention to mites because otherwise you're just throwing your money away. It's it's basically like, oh, well, let's go ahead and plant, uh, plant a whole garden of corn at my place. And then um, July comes around and we hit drought time and you didn't bother watering or anything. And then you wonder why your corn didn't really produce any ears. Um, I, I had that actually happen at my place. So that's why I brought that up as a subject. But um, you know, other things. You go to all this work and you spend all this money and a simple little segment of your time could, st could, could prevent you from basically losing all of that effort and all of that money. So please pay attention to that. That's, I can't emphasize that enough. You'll get tired of us saying it, but let me, I want to play on what you, what you said. Visual inspection is not appropriate for my account. It's not. Yeah, just looking at your bees does not tell you if they have mites because, what, 75, 80% of the mites are down inside yeah. of the brood under the cappings. Right. And even when there isn't any brood and all of the mites are on the adult bees, they always go to the underbelly of the bee and they're half hidden underneath the segments of the bodies. So you're never, not never, you're almost always. never going to see a mite on the back of a bee. That's a rare occurrence. The mite is basically just crawled up onto the bee at that point. And, and if you do, that hive is already in trouble. I mean, it, it, it is in trouble. Make a note, whatever, whatever. That, that hive is going to need intervention before winter, certainly. If you can see them, sometimes it's, it's like maybe too late for that hive to, to, to do well without serious intervention. If it's August, you, you have time to yep. head it off. Yep. But yeah. October, November, no, you're out of luck at that time. point. You're, you, all you have is hope. And, and not only think about it, because um, I said this all works together, if you have an unhealthy mite-ridden hive go into winter and that hive dies, those mites are there, 
we get a nice warm day like we've had recently, that hive that has mites in it now gets robbed by your other hives. Those mites have every opportunity they need to hop on the bees that are there. I don't know how they can live, they're parasitic, I don't know how they can live, how long mites can live without a host, but. It seems magical that they just pop back up in the springtime, but. Yeah. But so if, if you have a, a mite bomb of a hive, it dies, it then gets robbed, that, that mite, those mites are going somewhere, right? They're going into your hives and maybe weren't healthy. So treat, measure, treat, measure, treat, measure. Uh, Are there preventative measures you can do to keep the mites down? Yes, we're going to talk about uh, integrative pest management. Just we're going to touch on it a little bit today and really hit it next week. So yes, there are some preventative that you can do, but I'll say it one more time before we move on. You're going to have to sample your hive. You're going to have to get an honest number and then off of that know what kind of treatment are you going to need to do. And then, and then give yourself enough time for that treatment to be effective and then recheck. Was my treatment effective or do I still have a mite problem? All right, we'll give mites a break for about 10 minutes here. <laughs> um, going into winter, your stores for your bees, for them to survive in Iowa winter, our slide says 110 to 120 pounds. That's the total weight of the hive. That's, that's the whole thing there. That's the woodware, the frame, the wax. Um, okay, the bees are gonna weigh a few pounds in there too. Um, 80 pounds of honey. About 80 pounds of honey, yeah. Which is 11 deep frames yep. equivalent. I think we actually have another slide that kind of says, well, so many here and so many here. I don't think that really is that, that important. Um, so, oh, and by the way, we're going to talk in Bee Club, right? That, that last Thursday of the month thing that we have throughout the spring, summer, and fall. We hit all this stuff again repeatedly. So this is an introduction, but this is not the only time you're going to hear this. Uh, entrance reducers. The hive I have over here, you'll see, has an entrance. It does not have a reducer. It's open clear across the bottom. Um, I reduce my entrance in the winter to about that far, about two and a half inches. Um, you can buy an entrance reducer, or you can be cheap like me and get a stick and cut it the right length and just wedge it in there. They also have mouse guards that you can buy. Yep, mouse guards that'll do oh, both. Sorry, last yep. thing on the slide. Mouse guards are a thing. Um, we talk about mice. They like to go grocery shopping in your hive. You can buy nice metal or plastic good mouse guards that fit that just right. Again, I go the cheap way. I buy um, the right size of mesh that I can put over that. The bees quarter can go inch. in and out. What is it? Quarter inch. Quarter inch. The bees can go in and out of it, but mice can't get through it, can't chew through it. And I can just bend that in there, staple it. And between the reducer and a little bit of mouse guard, I'm covered. I'm good. Um, I have gone back to hives this year where something has taken my my stick of a mouse guard and moved it. <laughs> so someone was trying, right? But um, so far it hasn't cost me a hive yet. Not this year anyway. For those of you that don't know the steel mesh, what we really mean is go to the garden center and get fencing. And the fencing that has quarter inch by quarter inch little squares, that's the hardware cloth, the mesh that you buy. You can just take metal shears cut a little strip off of there, build it, bend it into like an L shape, and then just staple it to the front of your box so that it's it's on there and mice can't go through it. Um, while we're here, um, we don't have a slide on it, but on my hive, you'll see under the lid, I've got two wooden pieces. Um, the bottom one, it, that is just a rectangle. There's nothing there. It's a spacer that gives me room to put um, winter feet on or a pollen patty, a winter patty, or uh, mountain camp that gives me space for that. The one above it is actually uh, that same quarter inch mesh and then cloth above that and that in that space I'll put wood chips in there that is a quilt box. My version of a quilt box. The quilt box is coming all sorts of depths and, and configurations. Mine's just a feeding ram but I put mesh in there, cloth so that my, uh, my, my uh, shavings don't drop down into the hive. The cloth just catches it and that'll wick moisture for me. Um, I've got an entrance opening on this end, so again, moisture, if it's just contained there, it's just going to mold. I want it to be able to drift out a bit, and it kind of acts like a hat. So this is my winter superstition. I put these on every hive I have, and I can go in there. If my chips are wet, okay, they're doing their job. If my chips are dry, okay, they're doing their job. I'm convinced. It just dumps my hives. So. And I've never used a quilt box before, but I am very religious about my ventilation where I need an upper entrance on the same side of the hive as my main bottom entrance. I don't, put a, I don't put the upper entrance on any other side of the box 
because then that's sort of like a farmhouse out in the country when you open the front door and you have a window or the door open in the back, that breeze just cuts right through there. Well, in the winter time, that would be just creating a breeze through your hive going right through your bee cluster. Um, as long as your entrance up above is on the same side of the hive as your main entrance down below, it doesn't matter if that wind's blowing 40 miles per hour, it's not going to cause a draft through the hive. It's just going to hit it and stop. It has the same air, same air pressure on both entrances. Yep. yep. Um, I do, you can take a look at it, I do have a entrance in the quilt box on the opposite end, but that's got, that breeze would have to blow all the way through all that uh, wood shavings I have there to affect it. And it's, it's little, I mean, it's a tiny little slit. All right, uh, starting in August. So disease and my control, we've talked about. Food stores, we've talked about. Ventilation, ventilation, ventilation. Um, you'll see other opinions on that. I think it's important too. Um, the, the, the going theory is that cold and moisture is a lethal combination for bees, but ventilation will wick away that moisture along with some other things like mountain camp or maybe a quilt box will wick away some of that moisture and that way your bees are contending only with cold and food stores. And Hopefully not disease, not parasites, not pests. They get past those and get into spring, hives alive. Well, let's see, yeah, Jason. I think most of these are just pictures. This is a day, apparently it's nice and warm out because we have bees up here. They are, um, this is gonna be warm, especially if the sun's on it. That's gonna be nice and warm. Bees are attracted to warm. If I go out and work bees on a, on a winter day that's kind of warm, um, I'm warm. So I, I'll likely have a few bees that have found me that I have to, Flick off of me. They're looking for warmth. Um, it's hard to see down here, but these are those entrance reducers and uh, mouse guards we're talking about. There's little holes there. Bees can go in and out. The mice can't. Um, what else do we have here? Yeah, pretty much the same thing. There's the slide you were talking about. Yeah. The, the person that built the PowerPoint thought there was, their opinion was the configuration was important. I put hives through the winter in every sort of configuration and it, yeah. I don't find a difference. But. Well, and then not, this isn't beginner stuff, but let me introduce it. You can, we're gonna teach you how to winter bees in Iowa through a double deep just like that with plenty of honey, plenty of stores, mites are under control, wrap if you wanna wrap, quilt box if you wanna do that. And, and for a beginning beekeeper, that's the best start we can give you. There's lots of other ways to winter bees in Iowa, lots of other thoughts. I've wintered a single in Iowa before, I've been in a couple of them. Um, but I really, that, that's, you gotta be on that, right? I gotta be on to make sure they have food, add plenty of supplemental food if, if they're not doing well, and I don't, I don't win all the time. I'm about 50-50 on wintering healthy singles in Iowa. That's something I, I wanna learn how to do that. Um, it's possible to do, it's a lot riskier than going with a setup like that through winter. Oh, if I already hit all this, anything else? Uh, Winter bees in Iowa, wrapping the hives, we've talked about this. Upper entrance, we've talked about that. Um, the upper entrance is good because you likely will have bees die in your hive. A number of bees will die and they'll fall. And especially if you have your entrance reduced, um, that little bit of an entrance that you have left open can get plugged by bees where they, they can't use it, right? You can also have drifting snow. That's also very true. Yeah, we didn't get much of that this year, drifting type, but you can. So that upper entrance gives those bees a chance to get out. When it's warm, the bees are, uh, are going to want to leave the hive. They, they will not uh, relieve themselves inside the hive. They won't, they, they really gotta go to the bathroom. Remember, this is a box full of females, sorry. They really gotta go out, they'll relieve themselves outside the hive and come back in. If they don't have a chance to do that, that's unhealthy for them. So, um, got to have an entrance. If they're all cooped up and you get a good day and they can't get out because there's no upper entrance and the bottom one's plugged, not good things are going to happen to that hive. They're, they're going to really struggle. Um, I think we've hit all this also. Again, the wrapped hives and bees yeah. uh, coming out. You'll see the opening up there. This is where they have an upper entrance up there. So they peel back their wrap and bees are going to go in and out of there. Um, uh, I guess there's an animation on the next one. There is. I don't know. No, what the heck? Mine doesn't show. I, I don't know. 
Uh, I think the next slide is, it says bathroom break. That's, we mentioned that they're trying to relieve themselves. And I think we might've seen this one already. This slide. Yeah. Pest management, this is, is this? This is actually the last slide the last for slide. tonight. So we'll, we'll get into chapter eight for honeybee disorders, parasites, and nest invaders. We don't have a treatment for these guys yet, except that in <laughs> Iowa, we don't have very many of these. I don't think any of these. We don't Iowa. have any of those. Well, I don't know that's what the DNR says, but no, I don't think we have any, not in Northern Iowa, but um, yeah, they're a little harder to deal with. Um, let's go ahead and take a quick break now. We'll probably get a head start on next week's content because it's large. Uh, we're gonna talk about mites for a while, uh, some of that integrated pest management stuff we'll talk about and probably be able to call it early tonight, probably go for maybe another 45 minutes or so after break. Plenty of time for questions, plenty of time for uh, interaction before we call it. All right, let's break. So we're going to be covering, uh, we're getting into the disease chapter and stuff here and I think for tonight we'll try to cover all the stuff on varroa mites and we'll leave high beetles, wax moths and all the other slew of stuff then for this last class that we'll be doing here. So. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and see here. Mm -hmm. So four pest management strategies. Um, the first one, do nothing. Some individuals out there are going the route of trying to have their bees through natural selection be stronger. Um, it's really hard to do this because there are so many outside influences. So you have two, three hives at your place, and you decide that you're going to change the world and try only, only going treatment free and never intervening with your bees and whatever dies off, dies off, and whatever lives, lives. Well, that's fine and dandy, but there's another guy that lives a mile from you with genetics, and he is treating for pests and parasites and pathogens. And maybe there's a commercial operation that's three miles from you that has 50 hives set up in a single yard that also your bees are then exposed for any time they requeen themselves, any time you make splits, anything else, you're getting those genetics. So even though you're going this treatment-free lifestyle here by doing nothing and hoping to get survivor stock out of it, you're getting all these influences from other beekeepers that are um, regulating their beehives and trying to uh, keep above an economic threshold, basically. Trying to keep more of their hives alive than normally wouldn't have gotten by if they hadn't have treated. So, while some people still try to pursue this, just know that you're going to suffer the highest losses and you're actually going to be a detriment to those other two beekeepers in the form that when varroa mites are involved and your hive dies due to varroa mites, uh, a little situation happens called a mite bomb. So your hive is getting sicker and sicker and sicker with varroa mites. Varroa mite population is skyrocketing there as your bee population diminishes. And at some point your hive gets so sick, they abscond from the hive. I, well, not if wintertime kills them off, but if late fall's kicking in there and you're getting to horrible mite thresholds, they will abscond from your hive. And basically all those bees spread out into the environment and move into other beehives that were okay out there. And when this is happening, they really weren't producing brood very well and a lot of the mites are on the adult bees and they just carry it out to other beehives in the area. So even if you had this magic colony in your beehive, in your bee yard, if you had two other hives that were sick and they abscond, all the mites from those two hives move into the hive that was magically fighting its way through there and just get a heavy dose of mites. And your neighbor, a mile up the road there, a whole bunch of those mites go into his colonies now and he's not too happy because he just treated for mites, say, three weeks ago and got them down to zero. And suddenly he goes out there and he's like, well, how the heck am I testing at three, four mite load level now when I wasn't zero? And it's because technically you might bombed him. So yes, you can do nothing, 
but there's just a lot of downsides to it, okay? All right, the next thing is reduce the number of pests, and third is reduce the susceptibility of the host. So with reducing the number of pests, either through integrated pest management, chemical intervention, um, I guess it really falls underneath those two there, you're physically removing mites out of the hive yourself. Uh, reduce susceptibility of the host. If you don't keep bees near anybody else, then you don't have to worry about mite bombs coming in there. Um, there are certain things we'll get into later here in the chapter, not covering tonight here, where location of your hives is going to reduce the susceptibility of your hives to like chalk brood, to uh, wax moths, to uh, hive beetles and things like that. So location could be one of the things that you are reducing the number of pests by. Um, if you even get into critters like raccoons and possums, uh, reducing the pests, there is gonna be ways of that. But obviously with reducing the number of pests, you are going to be with chemical treatments, uh, heavily focused on that. Uh, susceptibility of the host, that is going to be mainly genetics of the bees. So, some breeds of bees are inclined to being better against uh, foul brood. Well, not foul brood so much as chalk brood. Uh, some bees are designed to be more in a, uh, in a cool, damp environment. They're, they're more hardy in that than other races of bees. There are races of bees that, or breeds of bees that are very good against varroa mites. There is no breed of bees that is 100% bulletproof against varroa mites. They just, it, it, it's not a thing yet. I'm not saying that in 10 years it won't be a thing, but right now it's not a thing. I mean, nobody thought that tracheal mites were ever gonna be gotten rid of. And in today's day and age, uh, universities that wanna study tracheal mite problems in bees literally have to sample a hundred hives before they find one that still has any sort of a in infestation of them and they don't seem to really be diminishing the hive's quality at this point. So maybe in 10 years, bro mites will be that case. Did you have a question? How, yeah, how did they get rid of the tracheal mites? Was it genetics somehow? Well, for a long time, they kept trying to treat against tracheal mites. They had grease patties and uh, menthol that they were using in the hives to get rid of tracheal mites. And magically, when the bee industry got varroa mites and everybody was treating against varroa mites, tracheal mites just seemed to disappear. I don't know 100% if it was because varroa mites was the big concern and people just stopped treating against tracheal mites and bees naturally developed uh, biological resistance to them or if the chemicals that we're treating against varroa mites also just whacked the crud out of tracheal mites. But tracheal mites just disappeared. And then combination of the last two. Every, everybody I know of tries to do a combination of the last two, but anyhow, if you wanna go ahead and go forward here. That is what varroa mites look like on your, your brood when they get removed out of the cells there. Uh, that's where most of your mite population is gonna be living is during the metamorphosis stage of the honeybee. They love to go in there and a female mite will go in there and the moment that the cell is capped over, she starts laying eggs. Uh, the first egg she lays will, if, if she's a, let's put it this way, if she is a brand new um, varroa mite, never been mated before or anything else, the first egg she lays will be a boy, varroa mite. And her son will then hatch and mate with her. And from there on out, she will lay a whole bunch of girl varroa mites. Um, in worker brood, one to two varroa mites might actually reach adulthood so that when that bee hatches out, they will also be able to survive. All of the other varroa mites that are laid in there will be too young and basically when that is uncapped they dry out and desiccate. Their uh, outer shell has not hardened enough to keep them at a state where they can survive. They just 
dry up and shrivel up. Um, once she's made it, she can go into that next cell and she can then just lay girls from the stage out. Um, so one to two in worker brood and in drone brood, because they have the 26 days it takes for them to hatch out, you can have five, six, seven, eight hatch out with the drone. Um, there's gonna be a slide that comes up here of drone brood that there's a cross section and it's just gross. We'll get to that though. Next slide. This is that magic that we talked about earlier. Was it actually during break or was it during the it first section break, of class? Yeah. But you almost never are going to see a mite on the back of a bee. And if you do, that typically means there is a slew of mites in your hive that you can't see that are on the underbellies of the bees and in your, in your capped over brood. Next slide. That's a really bad sign if you see that, that your problem's worse than you want it to be. I mean, you could have just been magically lucky and saw the only mite in the hive. No. <laughs> but you probably have better chances of winning the lottery than you do that being the case. All right. So one way to get rid of mites or other problems in your hive is integrated pest management, IPM. Um, there's going to be, if you want to go to the next slide, it's going to talk about about, um, okay, it doesn't talk about that, but there is some of the stuff we come up here. Why don't you keep going? Go ahead. All right, so one of the techniques that they have for getting rid of mites for integrated pest management is screen bottom boards. Um, if you remember from our early class, these do remove mites passively from your hive. It does not ever remove enough mites that you could just use this all on its own. It is just like uh, going out to your garden and randomly going down a row of onions, tomatoes, whatever, and just pulling some random weeds there and going back inside. Well, you only, peel, uh, you only pull 5% of the weeds in your garden and the other ones are going to grow big and more are going to sprout up. Unless you thoroughly go through there and pull all the weeds, you didn't really help your garden all that much. This is passively getting a few mites at all times uh, out of your hive, because basically every so often a mite that is on a bee that's trying to crawl down into comb will instead just fall down to the bottom of your hive. Well, this allows it to fall on out of your hive onto the ground and those mites don't get back up into the hive. If they go down onto your bottom board, yes, they can just crawl back up onto comb. Um, this is more effective if you're doing powdered sugar on your hives. The mites have specialized feet that um, basically the particles of powdered sugar pack in there and then they can't grip onto surfaces and they fall off of stuff a lot more readily. But for that, you have to go out to your hives and every few days either use a special tool that's a bellows um, and will pump in powdered sugar in sort of a, a, a cloud-like form and will coat everything in a slight coating of this powdered sugar and then you'll get a mite drop from that. Or you can go out there with a colander and try going over the top of your bees and dropping powdered sugar from the top, but you'll have to do this every few days to try to actively get mites out of your hive because 80% of your mites are all in capped brood. It's not passively falling out of your hive the powdered sugar's not doing anything on that 80%. It's just whatever's clinging to adults, you're knocking off of adults there. So to really work in conjunction with this, you gotta keep going out there and keep going out there to really have some effectiveness. Turns your bees into ghost bees too. They, yeah, they, and it, <laughs> it tends to aggravate them too because this powdered sugar, while they like to lick it off themselves, they don't like you blowing it in there in a bellows and coating everybody with it and stuff. They they kind of see it as a slight attack on their hive, so you'll, you'll tick some bees off with that. So another type of integrated pest management is uh, these drone frames. Mites love the smell of drones. So this type of frame that is a green frame here, um, I talked in another class about how, how the bee industry tried to make bigger bees by having larger cell size. Well, these frames have cell sizes that are way too big for worker brood, but it's the perfect size for drone brood. And when you give this to a colony and they build out wax on it, a queen, 
when she goes and she's feeling out the cell and stuff, she's like, huh, this is oversized. I'm going to just lay boy bees in all of this comb here. And that's all she will lay in there is drone brood because it's too oversized for worker bees to develop in it. So once she goes and lays this frame full, you're going to want to pay attention to it. And when it gets capped over, you take it out of the hive and you put it in your freezer. And you leave it in there for 24 to 48 hours and you just pull it out and put it back in the hive and you've essentially killed all the mites and all the boy bees that were on that frame. The bees will go ahead and they'll uncap all those dead bees and all the dead mites and they'll haul them out of the hive and dump them and clean the cells out and the queen will go back and she'll lay it full again. You're basically putting out a bait, a trapton, to get more mites to come onto this one sacrificial frame and you're actively removing mites that way. That's another way of doing it. You again, this does not get rid of mites in a big enough way that you can get away from chemicals. Okay, this is just helps keep your hives happier, healthier. Um, and it's, again, if, if you're the type of person that doesn't want to treat with chemicals, doing screen bottom boards and the green comb frames and powdered sugar, when you start combining some of those things, you might only have to treat once a year then instead of treating twice or three times a year. So you can get away from some of the chemicals by doing these integrated pest management techniques. Do not rely on them solely. Okay. I got um, something, Jason. Go ahead. So take a guess of what happens if you do this. The queen lays it up with drones, and you forget it's in there. Mm. Yeah. You, you've, you've created, potentially created, your very own mite bomb. And now, now you have a problem. That's why that controversial is there. Because you, you can, this done incorrectly, can drastically cause harm to, to, your, to your hive and increase the mite population. Yeah, because you're actually stimulating the hive to produce more drone than it probably would normally. Because you're, you're giving this perfect frame for the queen just to lay tons of drones in, so she wants to use it for that reason. And now you've created a nursery for extra mites to be born into. And again, remember with drones, a whole bunch of, well not a whole bunch, but six to eight mites emerge out as opposed to one or two emerging out and you you've really upped your odds for growing mites as opposed to getting rid of mites there you go can you do that as a way to sort of diagnose whether mites are a problem can you see the mites in the, the pupae or whatever they're yeah you can um if i think yes shannon's class there i did see for the tools there is, there's a honey uncapping comb that has all those little pokey fingers with it uh, you can actually go and stab it in at an angle through a bunch of that drone brood and pull it right up and you'll have skewered like 40, 50 drones at one time and pulled them out of the cells and you can look at them right there in the, in the sunlight and see if they're covered in mites. You see a whole bunch of red dots, you can assess that, yeah, your hive has a ton of mites in it. If you're looking at it and they all just look like perfect white body drones and you don't see a single dot on them, then you could have really nice low mite loads. You'll get the same thing in, the, in a double deep. The queen will tend to, um, to create drones on the bottoms of your frames or if your gap is too large between your top and bottom box, then they create drone comb there. When you separate those boxes, you may be opening some drone brood and see in there, much like you would if you took a capping fork to a, to a frame like we had on screen, You'll, your drone brood will just open up that's there, right? And again, again, this isn't how you measure whether you have a mite problem or not, but if you open up drone brood and there's nothing there, it's not a bad sign, but it's it's also not a sign that you, you do not have mites. I don't know. I, 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 I'd have to say that half the time when I'm going through an apiary, if I'm not gonna do a alcohol wash or an ether roll or one of the other ways of formally checking for mites, if I open up 10 hives through one of my yards and not a single one of them, I saw mites on those that drone brood between the two boxes. Because again, the queen always lays some drone brood in there. When you pull those boxes apart, you just rip those cells open and you can see the white drones laying there. Just look at them quick. Oh, yeah. All of them are perfectly white with no red dots. That's, that's pretty nice 
you know, reassurance that your mite levels are low. The moment you see two, three of them sitting in there, you're like, oh, maybe I should do that ether roll. All right. This slide here is talking about um, mostly chemical dependency and not using the same treatment over and over and over and over again. So if this year you used Mitoway check strips or if you use Apovar Life, next year you should probably buy um, what's that one that you just were telling me for class? Formic Pro. Formic Pro. You should probably go and switch it up to Formic Pro or try a different chemical because what this is kind of showing here is so you had all these mites here and that one and that one were especially resistant to the chemical you use. So you use this chemical and you killed most of the mites, but those two are here still and they bred more mites and their children, now there's more of those that are resistant. So you did that same chemical treatment, which got them down to here, but again, then they populate and over and over again. Well, now you're basically two, three generations out, two, three uh, times of treating with the same chemical. Well, now the mites that you're breeding in your hive are mostly resistant to that chemical you were using. So they, they say in the bee industry, well, if you treat it in the spring with this chemical, treat in the fall with a different chemical. Mm -hmm. And just because the names are different, you should really look what the active ingredient is. If formic acid is the active ingredient in this chemical, try to find um, oxalic acid in another chemical or... Uh, uh, thymol. Thymol yeah. in another uh, chemical being the active ingredient. Try to get... A, a rotation setup where you're giving them different treatments so you're not breeding resistant mites. Because you don't want that August treatment that you're doing to be the chemical that all of those mites are resistant to, right? You want that August treatment to wipe out 99.9% .9 of the mites in your hive and be able to breed out that nice fat winter bee that's disease free. Well, you just shot yourself in the foot if four times that season you're treated with the same chemical and that's the one you're using that fall. The mites are such a problem because they've adapted to our our European honeybee and, and if you're not if you're consistent if you always do the same thing in your apiary they'll adapt to you too and you need to rotate you need to rotate what you're doing. All right they suggest to only treat when necessary. If you ask Andy Joseph, if he sees two or three mites in a hive, he feels it's necessary to already treat for mites. Uh, just because he knows the problems that happen with the pathogens that they carry. Um, if a mite only carried one pathogen, it wouldn't be so bad. But when you get three different diseases in your hive, it really starts taking effect on things. Um, Many treatments available, none of them are perfect. Resistant treatment, yep, we were covering that on the previous slide. Um, one of the things is all of these pesticides that you're doing to kill mites, they are not FDA approved to feed to humans directly. So when you have honey supers on, you're not supposed to be treating for mites. There are a couple of things that you can do while you have honey supers on. Um, oxalic acid, because it is found in honey, mm -hmm. you can treat with that. However, when you have honey supers on, it's the wrong time to treat with oxalic acid anyhow, because it only kills mites on adult bees. And well, we talked earlier here how there's only 20% of the mites ever on the adult bees. They're all in the baby bees inside those capped cells. So. Um, there is some delayed release oxalic acid treatments that a person can do where Look up like Randy Oliver and a few other Beekeepers there that are doing stuff where they're putting these acid treatments on shop tile shop towels and um, Oh, I'm trying to think of the, the type can't think of the material, but there's another type of material that they're treating that absorbs the chemical and will keep the oxalic acid that as the bees passively walk over it, they get it on their feet and they keep spreading it through the hive. 
but he'll give like a 14 day release or a 20 day release that's slow of the oxalic acid, which the bees don't care about because again, it's found in their honey and you're essentially just raising the pH of the hive slightly higher than it would normally be, but it's to a level that kills mites, but the bees don't care. So that's all you're really doing with oxalic acid, raising the pH level of the hive to a point that kills mites, but the bees are perfectly comfortable with it yet. Um, but there is some work being done on these delayed release treatments. So you could do that during times where you have honey supers on. If you're doing the oxalic acid treatment where it's vaporization, you're wasting your time if you have brood in the hive, okay? So they'll, they sell a little vaporizing tool that looks like a wand uh, to the hobbyist. And it allows you to put a couple of grams of oxalic acid, this little white powder. If you wanna buy it commercially, it's known as wood bleach. You can buy like a 40 pound bag off of Amazon for pennies a treatment, or you can go to Man Lake and buy a bag of oxalic acid for like, I don't know, $2 a treatment yeah. and uh, buy it that way and stuff. But it's just way simpler to buy wood bleach from Menards or hardware store or whatever. And it's the exact same chemical that's there, oxalic acid. But you put a, a few grams on it you put it inside the hive and you hook it up to a small car battery. Get a lawnmower battery, something like that. And it heats the plate up um, really, really hot to the point that this liquefies and then turns into a vapor and clouds up in your hive. And when it touches surfaces, it cools back down and it crystallizes on those surfaces. And basically you're doing a, you're raising the pH on all the surface of the hive in there and you're killing off all the mites that are coming in contact with any of that vapor cloud. Well, it can't get underneath the cappings that all the drone brood are in and all the worker brood are covered over there, just as on the outside there. And over time that fades away. So that's why you're really not getting it there when the brood is present. Um, oxalic acid is suggested for late fall treatment or super early in the spring when you don't have much mites. There's even a uh, dribble that you can do over your hive where you uh, put oxalic acid in um, sugar water and you're out there with a turkey baster and you're you're putting some over your cluster of bees but you're going to want to do that when it's not you know freezing temperatures outside there's a the magic temperature range is it like 45 50 degrees yeah. that it's okay to dribble that on the it's bees in there but, somewhere, yeah. but anyhow so that's a way of treating when you you know I got off subject there. You would not be doing the dribble or the vaporization when you have honey supers on, but that's something you can do. One more, if I can do one more product, uh, the Formic Pro, which I do in spring, you also can <coughs> do with honey supers on, but it has a, an effective temperature range that you have to apply within, which doesn't really jive well with when we would have honey supers on here in, in Iowa. If you go above a certain temperature and you have the stuff on, you'll you'll harm your hive, you may smoke your queen. It, it, it's not harming your honey super to have it in at that time, but it doesn't, the, the time windows don't line up very well to do that here in Iowa. So just a suggestion, going into year two, in the super early spring, super early before dandelions are blooming, before you have any major nectar flow going on, you might just have a little bit of stuff trickling in do, do a mite treatment then. Put your honey supers on when the dandelion bloom starts and you know you're going into a nectar flow. And then just don't treat for mites until you hit the 1st of August and you're pulling your honey supers off. If for some reason you get into middle of July and you check for mites and you see you've got some problems, pull your honey supers off and treat for mites. Um, we talked in the one class for harvesting, if you don't have, um, if you have too many frames that are uncapped, well, you could just feed that back to the bees after your mite treatment and they'll put that in there as winter stores or whatever. But your main thing is you don't want the bees to die, right? If you get a smaller honey harvest, so be it. If you have to buy a few chemicals, so be it it's a much cheaper um, loss out of your pocketbook 
than losing your whole colony of bees, right? A $20 treatment, a $5 treatment, uh, maybe having 30 less pounds of honey that you bottle up and either give to your friends and family or sell at a farmer's market is far less out of your pocketbook than having to buy another $135 package or $175 nuke that next spring. So just put that to the forefront of things. All right, light levels vary across season. We'll get into that. I know there's slides coming up. They, we'll, I'll talk about the increase when we get to the slides that I'm talking about. All right, just go, go to the next all one. Right. You guys doing all right? This is the unfun part of beekeeping, by the way, so just we're trying and, to teach. And this will put some people to sleep probably yeah. even, but. All right, springtime. If you're, if you're in that early season and the hive hasn't blown up yet and you saw one to two mites, that's acceptable levels. If you're into June going into July and you found one or two mites in a check, that's still acceptable levels. Your population is going to be around 80,000 bees by the time you're into July. Um, you get into August and you find three mites in a colony in the first of August, that needs to actually scare you. And it needs to scare you because in the coming month to two months, you're gonna go from 80,000 bees in your colony down to only 20,000. It's going to shrivel up and shrink in size because the natural seasons are happening and the queen's slowing down. Well, the mites don't see it that way. The mites don't care that the bee population's going down. They don't care that winter time's coming. Those female mites just keep laying eggs at a steady rate. And mathematically speaking, if suddenly you are at one fourth of your bee population a month and a half later, and your mites, even if they didn't lay any more children, that three mite count, you should multiply it by four, okay? because you're at a fourth of the bees you had before. That's what should be going through your head first of August is a month and a half from now, I'm gonna have fourth of the population I have right now. So four times three, you've got really a 12% mite load that you should be looking at there because your hive's gonna shrivel up. What really happens is because the mites keep laying children, you don't go to a 12% mite load, you really jump up to 20% or 25%. That's what usually happens in that next month to month and a half. So three mites in August should scare the pants off of you and you should treat. If you saw one mite, you might decide not to treat. You might decide to do a light treatment, something more herbalistic like uh, using uh, essential oils or going and buying hop guard that's made out of beer hops. It, doesn't do a great job of killing mites, but you only found a 1% load there at the beginning of August, maybe you do decide to treat with something that's less harsh on the bees. So. How do you calculate the, the load? All right, we bumping. are getting to slides that will tell you how to do that. You kind of just covered this, I think. Just yeah, now. that is what I was talking about here. So. Your bee population is skyrocketing up. Your mites kind of have their own curve that follows behind it because more bees means more space for female mites to lay eggs into the brood and the population just follows along with that. The only reason you get the dip right here is basically because your queen stops laying eggs or mostly shuts down her egg laying so the mites can't find spots to lay their children in and stuff, but still everybody hatches out that was part of that. All right, we'll go on. I hate this slide, I just want to delete it. You want to skip it? Es essentially, what this is trying to show in picture form is the justification that you should step in at some point and buy a chemical treatment to take care of the mites before you get to a point that you can't recover from it and your bees die off. Does that make sense to you? So you spending 20 bucks to fix a problem in your hive, at some point 
is much better than you getting to the high point on that chart where you lose the $135 investment and you might also have then mice that get into your hive because it died off or wax moths get in there and they destroy all the honey crop that you even could have pulled off of those bees and stuff and you just have a total loss on your colony. So I'm like, just that picture just kind of doesn't really explain it very well. So uh, hold on. I think you've hit most of this already. All right. So location. The one instance where location is going to help you with mites is staying away from somebody that doesn't control mites. Or staying away from, no, commercial operations shouldn't really make you afraid. If anything, commercial operations should give you a little more peace of mind because they religiously treat for mites. They probably have some of the cleanest hives in the state of Iowa, mite-wise, and it's your no offense, it's the hobby beekeepers that usually have the dirtiest hives for mites because they aren't great at spotting them their first few years. And they also... The livelihood does depend on clean, clean bees. Yours does, right? You, yeah. you have to have clean bees or your business is in trouble. And, but what I was touching at earlier with doing powdered sugar rolls or just breaking apart boxes, some of the hobby beekeepers will just assume my hive doesn't have mites. And that assumption is usually wrong. The commercial guy is like, all right, I don't see any mites. Let me open up another hive and another hive and another hive. I didn't see any mites. Well, my time scale regimen says that this is the season I should be seeing some mite problems. Let's go ahead and do one ether roll today. Ah, there's some mites here. Slap a treatment on everybody in this yard. Bingo, bango, they are taking care of it. So, um, small cell. The university studies really are not pointing that as something that is practical for fixing mites. Um, large cell that was developed for creating bigger, better bees that caused the whole problem in the industry, going small cell, didn't really decrease the number of days for the brood to hatch out. Um, there's still some people hoping and praying that it fixes things. Um, a few people out there are still saying, well, I see lower mite levels in my hives. Unfortunately, university studies that have been done where they take 100 colonies of this and 100 colonies of that, they don't show differences with the small cell versus regular cells. So, I don't know. That's, that right now, there's no conclusive data to really help. Physical controls, we talked about the screen bottom boards, uh, drone cone trapping, powdered sugar treatments, and miticides are your chemical controls. Powdered sugar, alcohol, wash. These are really not explaining the stuff. Go ahead to the next one. This is the ugly one. All right, so there's still another slide that's worse yet that's coming up here for the drone brood. That one, but that's the horrible one. All right, this was, and you might actually see this someday when you just pull those boxes apart and you see all the drone brood that the queen laid right in between those two boxes. If you see all those, and this looks like they're black dots, but if we had better color resolution on here, those would be your blood red dots on the bees there. You can see how many are littered in all those drones there. Um, if I had to spitball, if I, if I just pulled open a box and I saw that on all my drone brood, I would guess that I was at a saturation of anywhere from 20 to 40 mites per 100 bees, or 20 to 40 percent saturation. That is just sickly, nasty. Uh, mite loads there. So can I ask you, at that point, are you are you looking to isolate that hive from the rest of your operation, or are you going to try to treat, no. it, treat it in place? I, I, I would not bother to move it out of the yard, commercially speaking. Mm -hmm. um, if this was, oh, well, shoot, even, even late into fall, I know I'm going to take mine out for almond pollination, and I know I've got ability to fix this. 
if I was back at the hobby level and I knew I was wintering the bees here in winter time, I would try a very harsh chemical on this just to get rid of the mites. If, if, I, if I saw that this was November and October, November, at that point I might just be sacrificial with it. I'd close up the front of the hive and yeah, I would haul that away and stuff and just try to let it die out somewhere. I might even try just killing off the colony manually mm -hmm. because I, who knows, I might be placing that colony next to some other beekeeper harming their operation and stuff there. But if this was August and you're still a hobby beekeeper, a harsh chemical would clean this up because there are chemicals out there that will give you a 98 to 99.9% .9 kill on your mites. And if this is early August, you still have enough generations of bees that that harsh chemical get out of there and your disease pop, your disease levels will diminish with the, each sub subsequent generation and you'll get to the point where they can feed fat, nice, healthy children to go into winter time. But this would be the point where if you were that guy that uh, is trying to be chemical free, I would want to slap you across the face and be like, <laughs> fix this right now. You are, you are the problem in the state of Iowa right now. You are causing everybody problems. Fix this. Okay. So here's, okay. here's how, you, how you measure. All right. So you want to get a mason jar. And um, there are different sizes of mason jars. So that medium-sized pickle jar, that would be the inch or so that it's talking about. If you're using the smaller sort of, I don't even know my dimensions so, so on those, but the, the little sauce jars that are the mason jars. So the bigger ones are quarts and then pints are typically like, I, I would yeah. I would want to get it about that full and stuff there if it's, if it's the little one. If it's the big jar, you only need to get about an inch down there. And you'll actually be counterintuitive on this and you'll slide the jar down on the frame. You would think by sliding down, you're just pushing all the bees off of it. And there's a slide coming up here and it'll kind of show it to you. But if this is the surface of your frame, you actually are lightly dragging the lip of the jar over the bees backs. And what happens is the bees sitting here and that jar hits it and it flips over and falls in. When you try scooping, you actually get so many bees stuck underneath the edges, they're rolling the opposite direction and trying to roll under the jar. You don't get many in there. So take it down your frame and a whole bunch just fall into the jar. And you'll just do that a few times quickly. And you'll be watching to see how many fall in there. And it's really easy to take that little canning lid. You don't have to screw a whole lid on there. Just put the little canning lid over the top of it immediately when you get that. By the way, we're, it's assumed here, we're not sampling our queen. Right? Our queen's out of the way. We know she's not on the frame we're sampling. Yeah, look at the frame first. <laughs> don't roll your queen in there. That, that's a bad move. So anyhow, you've got now the, the mason jar here, and we're talking about the ether roll for this. So you literally take a can of starter fluid. You know, sold in any gas station, any hardware store that has an automotive section, you just buy starter fluid, and all you do is go That's all the amount that you needed to put in there. So you just lift the lid up, put the lid back down. Now you take, set your ether down, take your jar, and just shake the crud out of it for a while. You'll do this for like, you know, 15, 20 seconds, and you stop doing that, and every bee in that jar is going to be dead and turn almost like a blackish color because that ether just got on its body. All the hairs got wet on it and stuff from the ether. And what you'll see when you hold the jar up and start rotating it is all that violent shaking, the mites died also, but they're small enough that they stick to the wet ether on the, on the sides of the glass jar and the bees are heavy enough, they just roll around in the jar. So you can rotate it 180 degrees, count all the dots in there and based on the number of bees you knocked into the jar off of that measurement there, um, you'll be able to tell percentage-wise what you're sitting at for a mite level in your colony. Um, 
If you were using the, I, I always like to use just the small little sauce jar and I put about an inch of bees in there. Mm -hmm. That's about a hundred bees at that point instead of doing the 300 sample. And then I just count the number of mites there. That's my absolute percentage there. I mean, a larger sampling is probably going to be playing it safer for getting a accurate average, but a hundred bees, if I see three mites, that's good enough for me to tell me 3%. I'm gonna sample several other colonies anyhow, and I'm gonna see what the average of the yard is and treat accordingly, so. We'll hit this again when we get again more into club, club time, um, but that sample, do I wanna sample a frame that's on the outside of my box? Do I wanna sample, what, what do I wanna take my sample from? I take my sample from the worker brood area. Right. I, I don't bother doing the outside frames with their, would be heavier with the drones. Um, I want to sample the nurse bees that are on the brood frames themselves. Right, and there's a big difference, right? Your nurse bees are gonna carry mites. Uh, your worker bees that are up in your honey supers, you're wasting your time on them because they're actually not in the hives very much and they're not about around the cells that would contain the mites. They're just passively walking by to deposit the nectar up in the honey supers and stuff there. You want the nurse bees that if the mite hatches out with that baby bee, it can go onto a nurse bee, or technically the baby bee itself is considered a nurse bee and would have the mite on it. You're getting a true sampling right there. Yeah. Uh, next slide, we're gonna get into some of the pictures here. So that's the starter fluid there that he's spraying in there real quick. Next slide. That'd be a picture of shaking the jar there and looking at the dead bees. Next slide. And that, is a oh. nasty concentration of mites in the jar. Every one of those little dots there is a mite, and we're not even rolling the jar over at this point counting them. Because you're actually, when you roll that jar over, it's pretty much an even coating from all your shaking that is gonna be on the jar. Yeah, okay, sticky boards. All right. I have never used sticky boards for mite counting. There is math behind it in the next few slides. We'll get into that there. Um, if you have a screen bottom board, uh, there is nine times out of 10, a special slot where you can stick corrugated plastic underneath the screen itself. And you normally coat it with uh, petroleum jelly. So you just buy petroleum jelly and you just smear some on uh, picture that you're coating a, uh, a cooking pan to go in the oven with, you know, Crisco, but instead you're using petroleum jelly on this and stuff there. So you'll throw it in that little slot back here that goes underneath your screen. And most sticky boards will have squares on them that correlate to a mathematical equation based on the number of days that you're going to leave it in there. Some people will put a sticky board in there for just 24 hours. Some people will do a three-day drop, but essentially every mite that fell off of a bee gets stuck in the petroleum jelly and can't move. It just stays there on the petroleum jelly. And when you pull the board out, you will sit there and you'll just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and you'll count the mites that are in one of those squares there, and you'll take it against the mathematical equation. They did it that way because if you have a piece of corrugated plastic like this and you sit there and try to count all the mites there, you're gonna lose count. It, it's way too hard. You're also gonna get specks of pollen. It's, you need to see this in better color, but that's like an orange granule of pollen and that's an orange, this, um, sorry, this is just a bad slide, but pollen falling off the bees will also be on this board, so you'll have to, look at it closely and pick out the actual mites versus pollen particles. There's the math here. So, spring, summer, sticky boards, left on five to 10 days. Adult bees, over three to four, brood over 5%, exceeds. I don't, since well, I never do this, I don't know the math on well, here's And here's what I get from this. So over the last several years, the tolerance at which you, we recommend that you treat has gone down. So there was a day where, okay, at 6%, you should probably treat 5% or below, you might be okay. Then it was, okay, 5 
you probably should treat and at uh, you know three four percent maybe you're okay we're down to like how many mites one two th I'm treating done that that's just that, because that's it's that serious with the diseases that they bring yeah. into your hive that you're at a two to three percent load in August just treat um, springtime uh, you can still be at that five six because it's your population is going to go up and it's actually the mites fall behind that and right everything. for a little bit they do yeah all right what are products now all right and some of this might actually be outdated in this presentation yeah, here because be. um apigard it's thymol based it's one of the products that you can use this is what you want to take away from it thymol based so if the next product you're buying is also thymol brace based but has a different name that's basically the same thing as you treating with the same thing over and over again so always look at the active ingredient there go to the next one. Oh, i thought it was going to go to several more chemicals all right we can go back to the thymol there all right um I'm not sure. Trying to to yeah. There's this one's temperature sensitive, uh, and there's yep. <coughs> there's instructions with it. Right. If you are in the hot part of summer, I know it's just one. It's half a tray, isn't it, or is it one tray? So, okay. Anyhow, in the middle of summertime when it's hot, you can get away with half the chemical treatment right. for your hive there to basically have a high percentage kill of mites. If it's the early time of the year or the fall time when you're into cooler temps, you're going to have to have the full dose treatment that is recommended. And I can't remember if it's two trays or if it's half a tray and half a tray or what the, yeah. the situation is. But I know it's, it's double in the cooler times of the year with the thymol based product. The important part is follow their, because the directions from these uh, myocide producers have changed also over time right they're learning as they go how to best apply this and and take care of uh, the, the mite load and not harm the bees but they're going to have instructions and you need to follow them and they usually have uh, a combination of uh, the, the temperature range you can apply it in and the length of time that you should apply this uh, read their instructions they'll get th those will slide along and and you'll have to find a way for that to work with the weather you're experiencing at the time you have the treat so it's, it's active, it's like a math problem. You gotta follow their instructions. What, what I'm sure not sure why young larvae is thrown into this chapter here at this point. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. We're into other, I think we're out of, yeah, I think we're out of Varroa territory. Jason, I think is where we are. Yeah, we're into okay. Calvary. So, All right. probably so a good place to stop. Will be this, yeah. And maybe we'll review the rest of this chapter and try to edit it yeah. back to, because some of this stuff needs updated that's Great. in here. So probably a good place to start as far as our content. We threw a lot at you guys. And again, this is the not fun, right? This is the, the, this is the parental part of being a beekeeper, um, taking care of your hive and treating it as if it, it, it's vulnerable because it is. We threw a lot at you. We'll, we'll review a lot of this through our bee club, especially as we get into um, July, probably our July meeting, we start talking about mite treatments because by the end of August, when our next meeting would be, you should, you should be treating. So we'll hit this again, join club. We have time for questions uh, about this. First one. year as a beekeeper is going to be your easiest year ever because it's brand new bees on brand new frames on brand new equipment. You're not going to have the carryover from past years of chemicals in your hive, of just, you know, any trace diseases that can carry over from season to season. This will be your easiest year. And as long as you take care of mites in August, this will be your highest success year for getting through winter time. As long as you keep the, that, that mite treatment in August at the top of your mind, okay? Year number two, you need to be a lot of people get through that first year and then they get real cocky with it. That's right. Like, yeah, I made it through. That I was me. It. That was me. All, all those little tips and tricks that I, I learned on YouTube from guys that only have 10 videos out there and call themselves the, the super cool bee guy, um, <laughs> they must be, you know, the factual. And then you go into year number two and you didn't realize that 
you just got lucky year number one, or that treatment that they told you about just really did nothing, but you were with brand new equipment, brand new bees, and it just helped you along. So year number two, that's the year you need to pay attention to stuff a lot more. You're gonna come out of winter and you're gonna be a full-fledged beekeeper with all the problems that every other beekeeper had, and you just don't want to get too cocky about it. That's when mistakes happen. I didn't want to believe I had a mite problem my sophomore, second year, my sophomore year. I thought, hey, I'm doing, I'm doing something that no one else knows about, right? I really wasn't, you know. And and lo and behold, my second winter was awful. <laughs> it was terrible. Uh, besides crashing a whole hive stand, I, I had a mite problem. So. Don't let it get you down. There's a lot of good stuff. Your second year is usually when you get your first good honey crop too. Yeah. So, all right. Questions yeah. back. Do you ever find mites in the honey then? Mm -hmm. Well, they aren't in the honey. No, no. Uh, you would find a minuscule population on the adult bees that are trying to process the honey just by chance there. So if you found a 2% mite load checking on a honey frame, you should assume down in your brood box, it's a lot worse. But no, uh, a mite will never be suspended in the honey for some random reason. They don't go after the honey. They just want to feed on baby bees. Yeah. Yes. Um, you say the, the, the mite aside, you shouldn't apply it when you've got honey supers on, but don't you use, leave some of that honey for the hive to use over the winter? So if you like, don't keep the honey away for a few days and treat and then put it back? Well, the problem with most mite treatments is they aren't a two-day treatment. Most of these mite treatments like that uh, Apigard there. 14, 21, yeah. You know, th there's some that are seven days. There's some that are two weeks. There's some that are 21 days that you leave it on. Most of them that are like seven days, you put it on for seven days, and then you put a second treatment on right after that for another seven days. So... Are you going to take your honey supers off for two weeks and then put your honey supers back on? And in, I know that may seem perfectly logical to you, but you pulled those honey supers off and they weren't the right moisture content. You're two weeks of sitting somewhere, you're possibly fermenting that honey. And if there was any hive beetle or wax moth uh, eggs on any of that, they now don't have bees to take care of them. Those eggs hatch out and now you've got for two weeks worms eating right through all your honey cells there, uh, fermenting the honey, destroying it, stinking it up, defecating behind on it. And typically honey supers that you pull off mid-season and you don't do anything with don't last two weeks sitting somewhere. No. If they're indoors, they're going to have those problems. If they're outdoors, they're going to get robbed by because that honey's not being guarded by anything. So yeah. what do you do? That don't apply when you've got supers on. You only do it like if you if you for some reason needed to treat in July. You found that you had a bad concentration of mites in July. You just kind of sacrifice that honey. Um, if you had another colony that was doing great mite wise, you could transfer those honey supers onto the great colony and just let them have it, and they keep putting nectar in those cells and dehydrating it down and keeping it. Um, problem free from hive beetles and wax moths and everything else as if it was their own. But that's only if you had another colony in your yard that was doing great with mites and you just needed to fix this problem with. But the colony with mites, you've taken away all their food, right? So what do they eat for the two weeks? They've got honey down in their brood area also. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They always have some down in the brood area. Okay. Sure. Yep. But, um, and that'll last you for two weeks? Plus there's always incoming, unless you're in a dirt, there's incoming food also. Yeah. yeah, we're talking about July here. There should still be some nectar coming in. It's not gonna be bountiful in July, but it'd be enough to sustain them. Um, August is when we usually hit harsher nectar problems and would the hives sometimes go backwards in August. And that's usually when you pull the honey and hopefully they've already backfilled some of your brood nests. And if they didn't, uh, in August have already backfilled some of the brood nests. That's when you start thinking about supplemental feeding. That division board feeder, you're putting sugar syrup in there, uh, sugar water or corn syrup in there. Sorry, I'm combining words here and stuff. But, but no matter what, you supplement feed to make sure they have 80 pounds 
So if in July you pull those honey supers off and they had almost nothing down in the brood nest, you could put some in those honey in the, the division board feeder there for them. So keep in mind, beekeeping is a it's not a passive activity, right? It, you're going to be active, especially for this for for, for the pest management. Um, you know, those are your hives. You got to take care of them, and it's not something you can just put in the backyard and pull the honey off of. You know, three months later, it, there's more to it than that. But it, it's very rewarding, though. It's good stuff. And it's, it's not that's that much work to he wants to smack in the face because we just leave it sitting out there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's not that much work either checking for mites because we're talking three, four times a year you might check yeah. for mites. And that checking for mites might, all, might have taken you all of 10, 15 minutes to do in total. You walked out there with your bee clothes on, you puffed some smoke at the hive there. All right, 10 minutes have gone by at this point, just getting out there and getting the hive with a little bit of smoke on it and getting ready to open it up. You've got the hive open and you're literally 30 seconds and you've got enough bees in that jar to shake it up with some ether and do your check. Then you have data to make a decision on, right? Yeah. So you should do that in July, is that what you're saying? I'm saying multiple times a year you should be looking for mites. Every time you open your hive, you should at least be looking at that drone brood between the two boxes. You know, you crack the boxes apart. Just look at it. That could be a soft check, you know. It's not super accurate, but it, it's a nice, easy check to just always look at the open drone brood you just cracked open. If you saw some mites, that should further prompt you, I should do a real mite check. You don't see any mites. You could wait until later in the season when, logically speaking, you should have more mites later in the season, and that's when you would have to do a formal mite check. There comes a point in the season where if you're, if you're going to treat, you need the time and the temperature to be able to treat. And, and what Jason's saying is, yes, you, you keep an eye on things up to that point. There comes a point at which you got to pull your honey supers off and you have to at least check then so that if you do have to take action, you have the time and the weather that allows you to do that check and then treat and then check again before we get past the point of being able to treat. Right? There comes a point in time that's usually in August, weather is different every year, but it's usually sometime in August where if you haven't treated, you, you really are running out of time. And if you haven't checked, you, you, you're, you're having less time. You get a check, see what you have, treat, check again, and hopefully you get to that point where, okay, I'm, I'm ready for winter, there's no need to treat anymore. Or they're in trouble and you know it, and you decide what to do with that. That check again, Ted's saying, is you put the chemical treatment on, and wherever the, the instructions say that the dosing ends, so let's say it's a chemical that says seven days and you're just done. Well, it's seven days you want to check again and see how good it did. Because hypothetically, those bees might have been resistant to the chemical you chose. The mites. They, they could have come from parent hives. That that's the treatment that they had already been treated with, you know, twice over, and then you got a package. And that fall, you just happened to use the same treatment that the parent hives had, and the mites were resistant to. Well, that gives you an opportunity at the end of the seven days to go, oh shoot, I still have mites in my colony. I better try something else. Right. You don't want to just make assumptions and then pay for it later. Question over here. So why not after you install your bees and give them a little time to get settled in, why not just hang a couple of acre bar strips in there and let them get along for a few weeks and then do your test? Okay, if you buy a nuke, you could do that early in the season like that, yeah. where you just installed it and a couple weeks later you give them a mite treatment and they go on. Mite treatments are harsh on the bees too because remember this is a pesticide to kill a bug on a bug. Mm -hmm. If you install a package and they're just getting that first brood up and stuff, it's going to be 21 days before those first eggs are turned into adult bees and stuff there leave them alone for that first like month that that package is growing. 
You don't want to smack them with something harsh when they're just getting up on their feet and go. But a nuke you could do sooner than 21. A nuke you could because they already have all the de developmental stages of the bees. Um, I still, I still hate beating up on a fresh hive when it's just a few frames of bees. I would rather treat a hive that has a full box than I would a beginning start. A hive that's, or a colony or a nuke or a package that's just been transplanted into something else, they may just need one more reason to leave. And if you treat them and, and, and that sets them off, they, they may just take off. If that, not, that's true on a package. A nuke's not going to just not gonna leave. Do that. Well, they have brood. They typically don't leave brood behind. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there a chance when you get a package that it's going to be infested with mites? Mm -hmm. Or do you usually check if there's... Well, there's always a chance that there could be a minuscule amount in that package, but any, anybody in the bee breeding industry that is selling sizable amounts of packages, and typically all states require inspection and treatment and stuff of the parent hives anyhow, but there are case scenarios where somebody's just shaking some of their own packages and maybe they're shaking 20 or 50 of them and they aren't going through the proper channels you might get mites in volume that way if you're buying through anybody reputable well the hives that the colony that these packages are coming through they have to meet all of the guidelines for having regimental treatment have being below uh, tolerances basically they need to be down at two percent or lower for mite levels in the parent colonies and when they're pulling the bees off of these, these are already the adult bees anyhow, so you're getting practically any chance of mites being on those, because again, the mites are gonna wanna be in the brood that's capped over, not on the loose bees that they're taking out of there. And to get the way of harvesting bees out of colonies is to typically put a specialized box above your colony with a queen scent attractant up there and you pull a whole bunch of bees up into this specialized box that has all these wood slats in it that the bees can't hang on to very well and you just take that box and you hit it over a funnel and all the bees fall through that. Well, the, the, the bees down below that stayed with that brood and stuff are the ones that typically would have the mites anyhow. So you're getting a very clean, um, mite-free product if you're buying through a reputable producer of packages. If you're going through Billy Bob's beekeeping company that's only going to produce a handful of packages, they might be perfectly clean or they might be cutting corners because they're just getting into this stuff and they don't know the rules and regulations or they're choosing not to follow them. I've seen some people get into argue arguments on Facebook going back and forth saying, well, I'm selling nukes this year. I don't need to have my nukes inspected or I'm shaking packages this year. I don't need them inspected. Oh, yes, you do in the state of Iowa. You have to have your whole operation checked by the state apiarists. And people feel that's an invasion of privacy when they're getting their small business up off the ground, but it's the law. They have to abide by that. So anyhow. So no Sorry, I'm just ranting here. Bees. What's that? So no going to back alley, back alley bees. bees. <laughs> back alley bees. That's not a bad business. Some one. back alley bees come from very experienced beekeepers that are doing all the right things. But you don't know unless you ask a few beekeepers out there, hey, what do you know about this guy? Yeah. I, I can vouch for a number of people out there. Hey, uh, Mike over here, he's producing a number of nukes this year. I'd say that he's probably one of the most reputable beekeepers in the entire state of Iowa here. So I know his stuff is clean, perfect. I know he goes through the proper channels. All of his stuff is going to be perfect. It's another reason why we have a bee club, because you get that, right, that, that whole, that communal knowledge of who's doing what and who's available and who's, who's flying under the radar. So just, there's some good knowledge and, and good um, experience there to, to tap into. More questions? Anybody? Free forum here it doesn't just have to be about mites. So I had a question about the screen bottoms. That is, that's not the 
hardware cloth. Yep. Uh, like that's not windows. quarter inch. That is a different size there that is, is large enough mites can fall through it, small enough bees can walk on it and not go through it and stuff like, like that. There. Screen, would that be about right? It's, it's a little larger than your typical window screen for like mosquitoes and stuff. Um, again, you need it to be big enough that the mic, I forget the dimensions on it's it. That, that, There's uh, a certain number on it. That quilt it. box I have there is probably about the right size for screen bottom board I screen. Eight inch. Yeah. Eighth? Okay. Eighth yeah. Not easy to find, by the way. Eighth inch is hard to find. There's places around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one year I tried making like 50 screen bottom boards that I was selling and stuff to people there. I think I had to go to like five different hardware stores Good before enough. I finally found one that was, and it was an ace hardware store at the end that finally carried the right um, sized hardware cloth for doing bottom boards. But yeah. like, I know the big chains like Lowe's, Menards, Home Depot, they skip from window screen right up to the quarter inch. You can't find that in between size. All right, any more questions? Next class is an extension of the, the pests uh, chapter that we've started here. Um, it should be shorter, right? We should, we should wrap up next class, I think, pretty early. But read up in your book. This is, it will be the last class. Um, bring your questions and then um, after next week's class, the next time we'd meet would be at B Club, which would be the last Thursday in, won't be in March, or is it? I'll have to check. Yeah, it's the last Thursday in March. I think I'm gone. I think I'm traveling. Um, I am traveling, so you have to be here. Uh, well, well, <laughs> well, the good point. I'll tell you what, um, if you're not hitting the Facebook page for the Friendly Beekeepers of Iowa, get connected to that, and then we'll decide what we're, if we're gonna have a March meeting or not, because I'm going to Wisconsin, Jason's out of town. I, worst case, I could have Shannon here. We could maybe do that. And I, I can get someone to open the building. So, um, well, stay, get connected to that page anyway. That's where we have, we have cancellations or updates. 